Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 12th of May. And this quick, quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 15th of May, with me, Michael Hewson. Um, it's been a bit of a softish week for equity markets, both in Europe as well as the US. And I think a large part of that has been down to concerns about slightly um, softish softish growth, um, more aggressive central bank uh, tightening or further central bank tightening rate hikes. We've seen the Bank of England this week following the footsteps of the Federal Reserve and the ECB by raising rates by 25 basis points. Um, we've seen obviously the various discussions, the political theatre of the debt ceiling. People are blaming concerns about the debt ceiling for the slightly softish feel for equity markets this week. And we're not, we're not talking about significant weakness. We're just, I think, seeing a little bit of a drift lower really on the fact, on the back of, there's not really been much in the way of positive factors helping to drive markets higher. Your bond, bond yields are lower. So there's a little bit of a, I think there's a little bit of a haven feel to this week's um, this week's market activity. Um, if you look at the dollar over the course of the past few days, um, the biggest gains have really come against the euro um, and the Canadian dollar and, and the British pound and Australian dollar and, and the Swiss franc and the Japanese yen, which generally tend to act more of a haven in a slightly risk off environment. Um, been, have been uh, have outperformed slightly more. Um, if we look at the way FTSE's performed this week, it's not really been much to write home about. Yes, we've had a slightly more negative bias to it, but that's largely on the back of weakness in basic resources, energy, um, copper, um, iron ore, that sort of thing. And I think a large part of that has been down to I think concerns about the fact that the Chinese economy is perhaps not experiencing the type of enduring recovery that um, had been expected um, when lockdown restrictions started to get eased um, back in December last year. If we look at the FTSE 100, it's on course for its third successive weekly decline. Um, is there potential for further weakness? You know, does the sell in May and go away? Um, cliche start to kick in. I mean, I've never been a big fan of that particular cliche, and it is a cliche. Um, overall, we're getting a little bit, a little bit of weakness. But as we can see from this chart here, um, we do appear to be having finding a little bit of support anywhere between 76.70 and 76.90. So I don't really expect that to change in the short to medium term. I think the debt ceiling um, issue will get resolved. It always has done um, over the course of the past 15 years, every time the topic comes up, and I don't expect this time to be any different. There, been, there may be slightly more jeopardy, but I think an awful lot of it is theatre um, rather than anything else. We look at the, if we look at the DAX, again, we've drifted lower over the course of the past four days, so we have seen uh, a little bit of weakness this week. We are getting a little bit of an end of week rebound. But again, you know, if we look at this chart here, 15,700, it's a fairly decent support area. And we have drifted a little bit off, off the peaks of earlier this month, but certainly nothing to be overly concerned about, despite all of the noise that we're hearing about um, a big sell off in the stock markets coming. It could well happen, but talking about it is one thing until I actually see the price action confirming it. I'm not going to be jumping back in and getting all bearish on equities. There's just, you know, the price action doesn't support that. Um, again, S&P 500 still finding itself fairly toppy anywhere in and around 4180, 4200. Um, finding a few bids anywhere down near the, the, the May lows of uh, 4000. But even below that, you know, we, we're very much in a range. And the, the big question at the moment, I think, which is um, dictating sentiment is not so much how many more rate hikes are coming um, 
as I'm speaking right now to you, we've got Jochen Nagel, the chairman, the chairman of the Bundesbank, saying that more ECB rate hikes currently look necessary. Inflation is still much too strong. Can't expect core inflation to slow quickly. Well, you know, that is true. But certainly headline inflation does appear to be coming down quite rapidly. Um, and I think that's where we need to focus our attention. We also need to focus our attention over what is happening in China because this week we saw Chinese factory gate prices contract by 3.6% and headline inflation only rose by 0.1%. So there are deflationary trends playing out in China's economic data. And when we looked at the PPI numbers out of the US this week, they fell to their lowest levels um, in over two years. Um, PPI final demand fell to 2.3%. Um, and that was a much bigger fall than markets were pricing in. So certainly on the headline numbers, you are, we are seeing evidence of slowing demand in the US, slowing demand in China, which is acting as a lag on inflation, not only in terms of CPI, but also in terms of factory gate prices. And generally what happens in China doesn't stay in China. China tends to export its inflation or deflation problems to the rest of the world. So we are certainly seeing evidence of deflationary trends. And while we saw the Bank of England this week talk about um, the potential for further rate hikes, another 25 or another 50, um, there is a decent chance if these trends that we're starting to see play out, not only in China, but also in the US, start to impact here in the UK and in Europe more broadly. Now we've got, we've got UK CPI out in a couple of weeks time. Um, and we could well see a sharp fall in headline CPI then, but I will cover that in next week's video. For the here and now, we've seen the pound slip back in the wake of yesterday's rate hike. Um, it's this candle here. And we've also seen first quarter GDP come in at 0.1%, which was broadly in line with expectations. But what was surprising is we did see a much bigger contraction in monthly GDP for March. And an awful lot of that reason for that was as a consequence of strikes, which depressed activity in the services sector. But we also saw um, we also saw a little a little bit of a slowdown in retail as a result of the really wet weather that we saw then as well. So we could well see we could well see some revisions to that first quarter GDP number. But for the time for the here and now, um, we saw 0.4 percent um, expansion in Q4. And that's been followed by a similar expansion in Q1. Cable ran into resistance from this trend line that I drew all the way back from the highs back in May 2021, June 2021, and has been rebuffed at that trend line from this move here at 126.80. It was slightly higher. I had that line around about 127, and we have started to slip back. And we could see a little bit of sterling weakness play out over the course of the next few days simply on the basis of the fact that we've had a host of um, investment banks come out and admit that they got their cable calls wrong um, at the end of last year, predicting a move towards parity. So they've thrown in the towel on their negative sterling view and gone sterling positive, which generally tends to be a decent signal to go short sterling in the same way that when everyone went bearish sterling, um, the pound went up. I think the reverse could be true here and we could start to see a little bit of sterling weakness that sees us drift back to the 50 day moving average um, on the basis of this particular move, down move that we saw on Thursday. Looking at the weekly chart would appear to confirm that. We've seen some fairly decent gains over the course of the past few weeks, which would suggest we are due a little bit of a pullback and a little bit of a rebound in the dollar, um, which has started to play out over the course of the past few days, despite the hawkish rhetoric from the Bank of England this week. I think we could well be done when it comes to Bank of England rate hikes for all 
um, the, the potential that the Bank of England kept another rate hike on the table. And certainly we've seen investment banks pricing in at least another two 25 basis point rate hikes between now and um, the middle of the summer. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit dubious about that. I think we could well struggle um, to do that. A lot would depend on the inflation numbers. We could see a sharp drop from the 10.1% that we saw in March to around about eight, eight and a half percent when the April numbers are released in just under a couple of weeks time. For that, we've got the latest unemployment and wages data for March. Um, unemployment did tick higher in February to 3.8%, which was back to the levels it was in the second quarter of 2022. Um, we're currently in February wage growth has remained resilient. It remained steady for the three months of February at 6.6%. But if you look across a regional basis on wages, somewhat, some, some, you're seeing some wage growth in excess of between 10 and 15%. So that would suggest that perhaps the Bank of England might have room for another rate hike. But I think you have to put the, the wage growth that you're seeing in the context of where RPI is, where PPI is, and where CPI is. Ultimately, real wages are still negative. So when people talk about a wage price spiral, I sort of roll my eyes into the back of my head because you're not getting one. Yeah, wages are going up between um, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 percent. But why shouldn't they? You know, headline inflation is, tr is trending in and around those levels as well. So all people are doing, and you can't blame them for that, is trying to regain some of the purchasing power that they've lost over the course of the past 12 to 18 months. That is not inflationary, in my opinion. You know, you'll have probably many economists argue the contrary to that, but I would argue that's nonsense um, because essentially, but you don't, you do, you do, you do erode inflation by diminishing purchasing power, but it's certainly not a long-term um, strategy for getting the economy to rebound um, quite strongly. So there's a, it's a delicate balancing act. Anyway, I'm digressing and I'm you know, sort of rambling a bit. So um, there is potential for us to drift back towards these series of lows around here in April, around about 23 and a half. But I think as long as we're able to maintain the trend that we've been in since September and October, there is no reason why we can't go towards 130 cable. No, there's no reason not to. At the moment, the dollar's rebounding on the basis of the fact that obviously it's a little bit oversold. Um, we could see a little bit of dollar strength as people realize the Fed's not going to be cutting rates anytime soon, but neither is it going to be hiking rates anytime soon. At the moment, the market is pricing in the prospect of Fed rate cuts. Um, I think that's way too premature. We're certainly not there yet. Um, if we look at euro dollar, um, similar sort of weakness last week uh, and over the last few days, drifted back below this 109.40.50 area. We're tr currently tra trading below that, brings us back to around about 108.70, which is this low here. So we have broken down a little bit. So again, euro dollar is telling me that we could be starting to see a little bit of dollar strength in the short to medium term, and we could drift back down to the low to mid 108s over the course of the next few sessions on the basis of that particular chart. Euro sterling is a bit of a snoozeville, but then again, it always has been. Um, once again, range trading, pretty dull, pretty boring, not really much, there's nothing to see here. Dolly yen. Dolly yen is a tricky one. Um, but again, I think dollar strength is likely to be limited to these peaks here. We've seen a double tap there at around about 137.80. Um, so 137.90. Yes, we are trending a little bit higher here, but what we really need to do to signal further dollar gains is for us to move significantly through 138. At the moment, I think the dollar's trying to find its range against the yen. It does appear to have found it, 
but there does appear to be a cap at around about 138. That will continue. I still think there's potential for dollar yen to go lower um, on the basis of a tweaked monetary policy by the Bank of Japan. Um, so um, next week, as I say, we've got UK unemployment and UK wages. Wage growth, I think, is will will continue to remain resilient, which should help to support the pound. Unemployment should remain steady at around about um, 3.8%. So I, I really don't think that unemployment is going to tick up significantly. The, the labour market still looks fairly tight, it still looks fairly resilient, and wage growth still looks fairly strong. We've got Chinese retail sales coming out in the coming week, and we've got US retail sales coming out uh, um, this coming week. And it could, sh I think it's likely to show a bit of a contrasting picture. Chinese retail sales are likely to see a really strong rebound in April. We saw in the wake of Chinese New Year in March, a rise of 10.6%, which was the highest number since June 2021 as optimism increased that the Chinese consumer would help support the global economy in the wake of easing of COVID-19 restrictions. We've seen a, a plethora of positive updates from the likes of LVMH, Hermes and Caring, Richemont today on the back of Chinese consumer spending rebounding strongly, but these are all luxury brands. So generally luxury brands tend to be less price sensitive than say, for example, the more middle income brands. Um, so April retail sales, we could well, I think we're going to be see the best performance since March 2021 with a rebound of 22%. But we also need to caveat that big rebound by the fact that in April last year, most of the Chinese economy was in lockdown. So 22%, while it may seem a big jump, it's not if um, retail sales a year ago were really poor because no one could go out and spend money. So we, we, you need to, we need to set context around that. Industrial production is also expected to see a strong pickup from the 3.9% seen in March, with a similarly strong number of 10.1%. Again, um, similar reasons, a little bit of a rebound, but the baseline, uh, you get, you've got a weak baseline, so you have to take that into account. US retail sales, been fairly resilient for most of this year, um, saw a strong rebound, January 2.4%. We slowed to 0% in February, while March was revised up from minus 0.8 to minus 0.4. Inflation has continued to slip back against the backdrop of a resilient labour market for US retail sales. Recent earnings numbers have been broadly positive. We've also got Walmart and Target earnings, so the US consumer is front and centre when it comes to... Um, the US economy and, 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 and obviously consumer spending. And we could well see a modest um, gain of around about 0.4% in April retail sales after the decline in March. Obviously, the US banking, regional banking turmoil may have prompted a little bit of pairing back of consumer spending. But certainly looking at Walmart and Target and their numbers that are due out this week, Walmart has been the more resilient of the two when it comes to its earnings numbers. But when it reported back in back in February, the shares the shares fell sharply in the days after, before rebounding off five months five month lows in the 200 day moving average um, in March. So we saw the numbers come out here. We drifted lower. We've rebounded off the 200-day moving average, and we've seen some decent gains since then. Walmart posted record revenues in Q4. Really, really strong number of just over $164 billion. Um, on the outlook, the, the retailer was slightly more pessimistic. Um, but, you know, with, with respect to the full-year picture, Consensus forecasts appear to align with a slightly weaker quarter. Revenues expected to come in around about $148 billion. Um, but we have seen um, the shares rise quite nicely and they do still look fairly resilient. So Walmart expecting a fairly decent set of numbers. Similarly for Target, although Target has underperformed, it's more, um, it's much bigger peer. Uh, 
but nonetheless, we do appear to be a range in a bit of a range when it comes to target shares. Top of that range, 180, bottom of that range, 140. I would expect with this week's Q1 numbers, which are due on the 17th, Walmart's are due on the 18th, I would expect targets numbers to um, sort of give a decent tee up, if you like, for how well the, cons the US consumer is doing. I think one of the big problems that Target has had, which Walmart has hasn't, has, hasn't or hasn't dealt with as well, is costs. Target's costs have been um, a little bit of a problem. They were 82.2 billion over the course of last year. Um, so they haven't been as good as getting a handle on their costs. So certainly keep an eye on Target. In the UK, we've got EasyJet. Um, EasyJet's shares have had a really strong start to the year. And since then, we've run out of steam, finding a little bit of a barrier in and around that 520 area. And airlines have been a strong performer so far this year. But as I say, since March, April, we pretty much traded sideways. Um, the airline says it expects first half losses to be less than expected, about £400 million. It expects to exceed full year expectations for profits of £260 million. And yet to look at that chart, investors don't really seem um, that convinced about that. We've seen a 35% rise in passengers in Q2, a 43% rise in revenue per seat, and a reiteration of its H2 guidance of 56 million seats, a rise of 9%. An upgrade to EasyJet Holidays guidance to 60% growth year on year was also welcome when the company published its Q2 numbers. And group revenue is expected to come in around about $2.7 billion, while costs are coming in around about 3.1, sorry, 2.7 billion pounds while costs are expected to be around 3.1 billion pounds due to higher fuel prices. I think the key thing for me is the load factor in Q2. It was 88% um, with an expectation this will move into the mid 90s during H2. Ryanair by comparison is already in the 90s. So EasyJet has quite some catching up to do in that regard. We've also got Burberry numbers, four year numbers out on the 18th along with um, uh, BT Group. I'm going to focus on Burberry and obviously EasyJet as well as on the 18th. So we've got quite a busy day on the 18th. But Burberry, again, luxury retailer. Um, China is China and greater China markets were its weak spot for most of last year. So will we see a strong rebound in its Q4 numbers in the same way that we've seen really strong numbers out of the likes of Richemont, LVMH, Caring and Hermes? So um, I think that's pretty much it for, let's have a quick look at the Burberry chart and we can see that reflected in this chart here, pretty much close to record highs on Burberry share price. So again, if we get a fairly decent set of numbers, we could see another further kick higher. Um, we'll have a quick look at Brent. Oil prices are looking fairly weak um, and that's really a demand story rather than a supply story, it's a demand story. Concerns about slowdown, um, we're seeing it out of China in, in terms of the inflation numbers, we're seeing it in the US in terms of the factory gate numbers. These factory gate numbers are leading indicators or generally tend to be leading indicators of CPI. So in terms of decreasing inflation, they're encouraging, because obviously it means prices are, are rising at a much slower rate, but in terms of the global recovery, they are a little bit of a concern. But certainly for consumers at the petrol pump, they're good news. And uh, I don't think we can complain too much about that. Um, so that's it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you very much for listening.